Hi, everybody. I'm just going to give a couple more minutes for people to start joining, um, and then we'll get started in a few minutes. Thanks. I'm just going to give it another minute, guys. I've heard from a couple of people that they're having issues with the uh, Eventbrite registration link. So we're just going to try to try to send out that Zoom link um, one more time so that everyone can join before we start. But we'll start in just another minute or two. Sorry about that. <laughs> 
All right, well, I think we're going to get started, guys. Um, so thank you all for, for coming today to our workshop series uh, hosted by Watt ECS. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jillian. Um, I'm the president of our Watt ECS group, and we're a student chapter of the Electrochemical Society. Uh, and we're a group of graduate students who plan events to connect graduate students work and researchers working in the field of electrochemistry. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming today and for all of our, our members and participants to these events. We actually recently uh, were awarded a chapter of excellence from ECS, and that's in part to all of our attendees and, and members of our group. So thank you all. Um, and today we are kicking off our electrochemistry techniques workshop series. Uh, and today it's going to be on cyclic voltammetry, uh, which is a fundamental technique that all of us use in our electrochemistry research. And it's hosted by Dr. Rodney Smith, who is an assistant professor uh, here in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Waterloo, and also one of our Watt ECS advisors. Um, and his research focuses on the design, synthesis, and characterization of inorganic and solid state materials for electrocatalysis. So I wanna thank him very much for hosting this workshop today and kicking off this series. Uh, before we get started, a couple of quick sort of housekeeping things. If you are from chemical engineering, you can get seminar attendance credit for today's workshop. Uh, and I'll post the code for that in the chat box 15 minutes before the end of today's workshop. Um, and please uh, just keep muted throughout the workshop and then post any questions that you have in the chat box and we will go through them um, at the end of today's workshop. So with that, uh, thank you all and thank you, Dr. Smith, and I will let you take it away. Thank you, Jillian. I share the right screen. Can everybody see my web browser at the moment? Yes. Awesome. Um, yeah, so thank you for the invitation uh, to come and talk about cyclic voltammetry. Um, just given as kind of an open-ended, give a description of kind of any aspect that you want, more tutorial style. I wasn't sure, of course, CV is one of these techniques that is wonderfully simple and ridiculously complex at the same time. Um, and so I decided to do a span. And so we're going to start with some of the fundamentals to, to really establish the basics of what dictates what you see in the cyclic voltammogram. And then we're gonna go through some of the more complex and, and touch on some of the, the more advanced ways in which you can apply it towards the end. Um, so so I've, after four years of teaching here, I'm very tired of using PowerPoint, and so we're going to use a, a new type of format here. Um, and so we'll just kind of scroll down through the browser here, and you'll see that there's a little bit of code mixed in, and so we can play around with some of the math uh, that underlies some of this. And so we'll start with a very uh, broad overview, uh, just in case there's anybody that's uh, new to their grad program listening in and wants to learn a little bit more about this. And, and so cyclic voltammetry um, is a very straightforward process, right? It's, it's wonderfully simple to set up. And so you can go in the lab and you can get data today by just you know filling in a couple of boxes and pressing play on a potentiostat or an electrochemical workstation. And so our, our goal in these experiments is to monitor the current um, as a function of voltage and time. And so the voltage and time comes from a sweep. And so we're going to sweep a, a potential over time and watch what the current does in response uh, to these perturbations. And so that's where it's very simple. Uh, we have a very small number of parameters that we actually control while we're doing the experiment. Um, but we can extract a huge amount of information out of this. And as you'll see that um, the chemistry of your system really dictates what you're going to see. Um, and it is the electrochemical reaction system as a whole. And so in electrochemistry, we're used to looking at these uh, elementary reactions where we have uh, typically a one electron process is what we've broken it down to. Um, and so inside of this one electron process, we have some oxidized species going to react with an electron to make some reduced species. We have some thermodynamic descriptor saying what energy that's going to happen at. Um, this is kind of deceptively simple because when we're looking at uh, cyclic voltammetry, we're really looking at the system as a whole. And so as you'll see, there's a lot of extra considerations beyond what's just going on in the simple kind of one step reaction. And so the, um, based on the thermodynamics of what you expect, you're going to have to set up your uh, electrochemical cell. Um, you're going to have to set up your potential stat, all of your settings uh, with just a small number of parameters. And, and so depending on where this formal potential is expected to be, you would set an initial voltage where you're going to apply uh, to your working electrode to start, a switching voltage somewhere when you're going to turn around and sweep in the opposite direction, potentially a second one. And so if you, if you want to start somewhere in, the, in a central voltage, you can start there, sweep to one extreme, sweep to a different extreme and come back to your initial point, for example, or you could just sweep between your initial and your uh, switch location. 
you choose how fast you're going to sweep. Um, this is a very important parameter, right? And as we'll see towards the end of the talk today, um, this is really going to dictate what you see. Um, and then after that, number of cycles. And so it's important to kind of probe, uh, look for the steady state. What we often see is kind of a gradual shifting in behavior over time. Uh, if you want to have good results to analyze, you want to be as close to a steady state as possible so that each subsequent cycle gives you the same results. So we're going to play around with this a little bit uh, with this coding environment. And so basically all we're going to do, I don't expect everybody to keep up with the code. Uh, it's there and I might share it around with everybody later on, uh, print out a PDF of this so you can kind of play around with this at home by yourself as well if you want. Um, but all we're going to do to start is kind of define a bunch of parameters. And so we have our fundamental parameters, right? Our gas constant, temperature, and Faraday's constant. We can define the number of electrons, uh, our electrode, and importantly, our diffusion coefficient, right? how fast our species are going to diffuse through solution. We can set our starting conditions. Um, so we would have here, for example, 100% of some reduced species in solution with none of the oxidized species. Then what we want to do when you go to your potential stats, you're going to have little boxes that look something like this. And you're just going to tell it, you know, I, I want to start here. I want to go to that voltage. Um, I want to sweep at this rate and I want to do it this many times. And so what you're effectively doing is building this waveform. And so we can play with these values. We can decrease them. We can increase them, right? And we can go to negative, we can start at negative one volt. We're just changing where we start. We could do the same the other way, right? And so we can change uh, exactly how far we want to go. This, this effectively sets the window in which we, we want to look. That window is set by your reaction system, right? If you're in water, you have fundamental limits to how far you can sweep based on oxidation or reduction of water. So generation of oxygen or hydrogen. Uh, you'll have similar limits in other uh, solvents as well. And so choosing a solvent is really what sets that window for you. After that, you play around with your scan rate. Um, and your scan rate, of course, tells you how long your experiment's going to go. And so the tendency that I see is people tend to use very high scan rates, especially when they're starting, because it makes for fast experiments, right? And so here in under a minute, we can get a lot of data. Um, but what we'll see later on is that scanning at such a fast rate can really destroy a lot of the information that you're looking for. And so we can decrease that scan rate. The catch is, of course, we're making a longer and longer experiment. Um, but we've got a range. We, we can go anywhere from about a megavolt per second to uh, several microvolts per second these days. And so with, with modern electronics, we can span that huge range. Of course, that goes from having kind of millisecond sampling regimes out to, you know, stretching towards a day for your experiment, right? After that, we choose how many times we want to cycle it. We can add more and more. Um, and really, like I said, your goal should be to find a steady state. Right? You want to find the number of cycles where you're happy that you've reached a, a stable system so that when you're analyzing your results, you know that they're the meaningful results coming out of it. So as I alluded to earlier, um, this is deceptively simple, right? It's really easy to go in and just start getting data, um, but there's a lot of considerations that go into it. And there's a lot of ex iterative experimentation in order to get to the results that you're looking for. And so in order to understand some of this, you need to be able to make judgment calls, right? And so you might want to start your experiment with, you know, a nice fast scan rate, just a couple of scans, see where things tend to pop up and then start zooming in and looking more carefully, right? So starting uh, to play around with the boundaries of your window, starting to play around with your scan rates. Um, and, and you do that based on your analysis of what you see in those initial experiments. So we'll go over a little bit of what we kind of expect to see. Everyone's used to these kind of duck shaped curves that we, that we see. Um, and I see a lot of people stressing over the fact that they don't get duck shaped curves. That is very hard to make an, a nice, perfect, reversible cyclic voltammogram. Um, you know, it's not the end of the world. The structure of that voltammogram is going to tell you something. And so here's a sample uh, of what is there here? Two, two full scans. And so we start at our EI voltage. And so this one's starting at negative 0.5 volts versus our formal potential. And then it sweeps uh, anodically. And so we're going to oxidize. And so our completely reduced system becomes oxidized. We get this kind of exponentially decaying curve. It turns around and it sweeps cathodically now to a negative voltage. What we see is still a positive current, but it gradually decays, even though we're scanning negatively. We come close to our formal potential again, and we see the opposite. So we reduce it back to our starting point. And then when we turn around and go back, we now have this offset, but then we get essentially the same type of behavior. But the, the exact currents that we see are a little bit different. And so we can mark a number of um, key parameters on this. And so there's your, your voltage where your peak appears. And so we have an anodic peak and a cathodic peak, our oxidation and our reduction. We have some peak current associated with both of those. And if we zoom in, we can start looking at other parameters. And so if, if you've been doing uh, cyclic voltammetry, if you've started reading about it, 
uh, what you'll see is that there's a number of these different parameters that kind of describe the shape of the wave. Um, and so our, our peak location is just literally the, the highest point uh, in the current. Our half wave it, uh, potential is in between the two uh, peaks that we see, the anodic and the cathodic. And we can start breaking this up into different sections. And so if we take, for example, EP over two, it's just literally we take the height of that peak, we cut it in half, and we pick up the potential where that uh, current appears. And so what this is giving us is the shape, right? And so as we change what's happening in the system, the shape of that peak is going to change. Um, and so this gives us a means to kind of probe that shape of the peak. And there's a number of other types of parameters that we can use as well. So if you've dug through your textbook, probably the Barden Faulkner textbook, uh, what you'll see is a description of what we expect. And so based on temperature, uh, of course, uh, we have that RT over NF uh, portion that comes into everything. Um, and so if we simplify things, just say this is all at 25 degrees Celsius, get a number of these constants that we should expect to see. And so if we have an ideal perfect system in a reversible setup, um, the randall shevchuk equation tells us that we should have a, uh, a very specific uh, peak intensity, right? And so our current at the max at the peak is going to be dependent on a constant that's, that's based on a uh, number of factors, that RT over uh, F factor, for example, is factored into there. Uh, the number of electrons factors in, and of course, your area and your concentration, but importantly, the diffusion coefficient and the scan rate factor in. Right? And so using this equation, um, you can calculate, for example, if you're looking for diffusion coefficients, you can measure those. Uh, if you're trying to identify the concentration of some unknown species, you can calculate those. Right? And so we can use this characteristic behavior uh, in an analytical sense like that. But more so, that, that nice perfect duck shape uh, tells us about what we should see here. And so uh, there's all of these, these constants that are given to us that, you know, that the distance between the peak and the half wave potential, for example, um, is told, we're told this should be about 28.5 millivolts divided by the number of electrons, right? And so the, the greater the number of electrons, the tighter the peak gets, right? The narrower the full width half mass um, would be in it. We can break that up a number of different ways. And so we can look at the difference between the orange and the red, the red and the black, and the black and the orange, right? And so again, all of these are kind of different iterations on, on a theme. There's, there's some shape that's given to that. Um, if it's fully reversible, we expect IPA divided by IPC uh, to be equal. And so, as you see, if we just look at hard currents here, where we, so this is normalized by the IPA value, excuse me, you can see that the hard numbers are not identical. And so there's something else going on in that background, right? And so we do have to apply a little bit of thought when we start analyzing uh, what we see here. Um, and so, so you'll see uh, experimentally when you go in, uh, it, it can be quite difficult to generate this, even if you take something like ferrocene or ferrocyanide and, and try to generate this nice, perfect, reversible structure, um, it can be very challenging, right? The, the quality of polishing of your electrode surface, the cleanliness of your solution, the purity of your, your uh, redox couple, all of those factor in, right? And so it's very easy to, to skew away. And, and so this data you can see too um, is skewed away from this absolute perfect, our E1 half and EPA are, are not at this, um, 28.5 millivolts that we would expect, right? And so it's slightly below that. And so it's very difficult to actually generate that, that perfect behavior. Um, and so what we're going to look at moving forwards um, is understanding you know, when, when is good enough, right? And so um, I don't think we should necessarily strive for hitting these perfect numbers all the time. What we wanna do is have good control over the system and be able to analyze changes in behavior uh, as a function of your perturbation, which, which in cyclovoltametry ends up being your window range and your scan rate. Um, and a number of things are going to impact exactly what you see. Uh, and so one of them is going to be that reaction, right? And so we drew it above as you know, an oxidized species plus an electron goes to a reduced species. Um, that of course has some kinetics associated with it and it could interact with other reactions. It could interact with your surface. It could react with other species in solution, for example. Um, your electrolyte solution can have a huge impact. Impurities are one aspect. Another is uh, the identity of the electrolyte, right? Um, whether or not you have a protic solvent or an aprotic solvent, all of this is going to affect exactly what you see. The identity of your working electrode, um, the kinetics for the electron transfer um, can be tied to that working electrode, uh, whether or not there's a specific interaction or not. Um, your experimental settings, which is our primary tool that we're going to use to play with it. Um, and your process for extracting the parameters, right? And so if, if we look at this IPA over IPC again, very clearly we can't just take the hard number. And so we have to process this data somehow. How you process it, of course, is going to have an impact on the specific number that comes out of the back. So to get started, we'll do a quick review um, on, on some of the fundamentals, just so that we understand properly um, 
exactly what's happening in an electrochemical cell in these ideal situations so that we can understand when we move away from ideality um, what happens and, and what effect we're going to have and so starting with thermodynamics um, this of course is dictated by the Nernst equation and so our Nernst equation is uh, where we associate our um, reaction quotient to our equilibrium uh, species uh, with what we apply and so it, it defines an equilibrium voltage that we're going to say x is equal to zero zero because we're working at a 2d surface in a 3d system and so we're only acting at the surface of the electrode and then we have all of that bulk solution that we have to consider right and so what we're doing is changing our e equilibrium as a function of time this is being done at one specific 2d slice in the material in the solution excuse me in the solution so based on that, we have our standard potential, uh, which gives us our, our equilibrium point for, uh, for the reaction species by itself. We're going to skew that value by changing this EEQ, and the system is going to have to respond by changing the concentration of the oxidized and the reduced species. Right? And so this is where the electron flow comes in, which gives us the current that we measure. We can simplify this a little bit. And so the Nernst equation we can recast into an exponential form uh, is quite helpful if we wanna look at plotting things and looking at relationships, if we uh, define, if we normalize everything by the total concentration. And so we know that our total concentration of our species is gonna be the sum of, of the two, uh, of the starting material and the product. And so we have our oxidized and reduced species. If we divide both sides by, by CT, we end up with this equation, which we can rearrange, substitute and uh, rearrange uh, into this exponential form at the bottom. And so what we can do is uh, generate the, the relative concentration of R or O uh, as a function of where we are relative to our standard potential, right? And so we change EEQ, we force a change in CR. The change in CR is intimately tied to the uh, concentration of CO. And so if we plot this out, um, the Nernst equation using that exponential form, uh, we get on our y-axis our, our relative concentration of either the oxidized or the reduced species. And then our x-axis is the, the voltage relative to our fundamental equilibrium, that, that standard reduction potential. And so when, when our EEQ uh, that we apply to our working electrode surface is equal to our formal potential, what we should see is 50% oxidized, 50% reduced, right? As we sweep uh, cathodically or anodically, we're just going to change uh, the equilibrium point, which forces that flow of electrons. And so what we see is this limiting behavior that when we go to extreme cathodic over potentials, uh, we see um, a zeroing out of our concentration of our oxide species and 100% of the reduced species and the opposite if we go anodically, right? And so we get full oxidation. And so the bulk of this happens within about plus and minus 100 millivolts from our half wave potential in a, in a nice ideal reversible situation. These values are non-zero. They do go on for some period past it. Um, but because of this exponential type relationship, um, it's a very small change. And so, you know, within 150 millivolts, we have essentially none of the other uh, species present on the surface anymore. Um, and so this is really key to what we're doing. And, and so when we're uh, performing this, we're, we're sweeping this voltage from, let's say, the cathodic side to the anodic side. And so in real time, we're continually perturbing the system and straining it, causing it to do something to respond. This, of course, cannot happen instantly. We're working at a two-dimensional surface, right? And so as we act on that two-dimensional surface, we change the chemical equilibrium there, which then perturbs out into the solution. And so what we've uh, essentially done is created a diffusion gradient, uh, a very steep diffusion gradient right at our electrode surface. And mass transfer has to take place to deal with that, right? Nature doesn't like those steep diffusion uh, concentration gradients, and so it will diffuse to get rid of it. Um, and so mass transfer starts to kick in, and that's what we start seeing dictating a lot of behavior that we'll see. The other thing that can happen, and I won't touch on this too much today, is electron transfer kinetics. And so electron transfer kinetics, um, you know, th this is an equilibrium perspective when we're looking at the Nernst equation. Um, the system has is limited potentially by either transfer of mass to the electrode or how quickly the electron can be transferred, which is the chemistry going on in this solution. Um, and so what we have to do is as we sweep this, uh, we have to consider all of those different implications, right? And so how is mass transfer uh, and how is kinetic, how are kinetics going to factor in? And so we'll, we'll go into mass transfer a little bit here because that becomes very important um, in the classical versions that we see. And so again, we, we have to specify in the Nernst equation that we're looking at X is equal to zero. Where we're looking only, we're only actively doing chemistry at the electrode surface. And so we have this two-dimensional surface and a three-dimensional volume. Um, and so 
we have to start making assumptions here, right? And so once we oxidize or reduce a species, it's going to move out into solution and something's going to come from solution to replace it. Um, and so we have to understand what's changing in the system as a function of time because of that mass transfer. Uh, we end up with partial uh, differential equations in this situation. And so what we have to do uh, is start making assumptions. We have to define some limits to what can happen with the mass transfer. Uh, and so most commonly what you'll see, uh, what you'll begin learning is semi-infinite diffusion, uh, which basically just says that we can take a, a species from an infinite depth of solution, right? And so the longer we wait, it's just the further away we're grabbing extra species and bringing them to the electrode surface. Um, and so we'll, we'll consider here uh, what's going to happen in, in two different situations. And so one is we're going to step, so we'll use a, a solution that is purely reduced species and we'll step towards an oxidizing potential. And so in the first situation, we'll step to a large oxidizing over potential, and the other will step to this fundamental equilibrium where we should have 50% oxidizing, 50% reduced species on the surface. And so we can simulate exactly what's happening here. And so we can go in and um, so none of this is the simulation. It's just loading some data that I pre-simulated um, and plotting it out. Um, but we can simulate this data and look at what's happening uh, as we move away from the electrode surface um, as a function of these voltages and time. Um, and what we see is that there's a continual change, right? And so at time is equal to zero, um, oh, do I have, I might have my values reversed here. Yes, I do. Um, and so we're starting from E well below uh, our formal potential. And so we should have 100% reduced. And so these values are uh, incorrect. These should be O and R. And so um, what we're looking at is, is this. And so we have 100% uh, when we start out in bulk solution, we have 100% of this reduced species. We step uh, to our formal potential. And I've got, sorry, this is, should not be an equal sign. It should be a greater than sign. It's duplicating on both. Oh, no, sorry. Confusing myself. <laughs> um, these two should be different. And so what we're looking at here on, on the left uh, is we're stepping to a large anodic overpotential. And so we're completely oxidizing all of our reduced species uh, to the oxidized species. And so what we see at time is equal to zero is just a horizontal line. And so we have 100% reduced species. And then depending on time, what we get is um, an extension of a diffusion layer out into solution. And so at very small time intervals, at one millisecond, we can see that it's very tight, right? And so we're, we're down on the order of about a, uh, a micrometer near the surface. As we wait longer and longer time periods, this uh, perturbation into the solution concentrations reaches further and further away from our electrode surface. And then so we're going from one to 10 to 100 milliseconds out to a second. And so we can see um, that that's extending away from kind of single micron out towards the 100 micron styles uh, scale. If we look at what the concentration at the surface is, here we're stepping to a large anodic overpotential. And so our oxidized species at X is equal to zero is 1.0. We're com converting all of our reduced species into oxidized species. And the one on the right, this is where our title is correct. Our E is equal to our formal potential. And so they're, they're going to 0 0.5. And so we're forcing the electrode surface to reach uh, that equilibrium point. But that diffusion layer still extends outwards. Right? And so we've got that reduced species that is 1.0 out in bulk solution. As we come towards, it's going to have this diffusion gradient that comes towards 50%. And it's the opposite for that oxidized species. Right? And so this is. Um, of course, going to affect the current that we see because it's changing the effective concentration at the electrode surface at any given time. And so um, this is very important to the behavior that we observe. Uh, and so this is all worked out uh, decades ago. And so this diffusion layer um, is kind of embodied in our, our data that we'll see via the Cottrell equation. And so our Cottrell equation is given here where the current as a function of time um, is NFA times our concentration, but here's the important part is our diffusion coefficient, right? And so the larger the diffusion coefficient, uh, the larger the current's going to be. Um, but then we also have this inverse relationship with the root of pi t, right? And so as time increases, our current decreases. And that's explicitly because of this growth of the diffusion layer. In order to do that electron transfer process, we have to keep bringing a species from further and further out in solution, which of course takes a longer time. It's important not to uh, mix these up with the electrochemical double layer, right? And so the diffusion layer is this disruption in concentrations going out into solution, right? And so we've changed the equilibrium at the surface, and this has an impact reaching out into solution. The electrochemical double layer is a fundamentally different thing. 
this changes with time, right? Our diffusion layer will continually grow as long as we hold a voltage, uh, as long as we hold a potential that's not what the system wants to be at uh, in bulk solution. But our electrochemical double layer is a very short thing, right? And so we're, we're talking on the order of nanometers. Um, it's literally two layers of ions near your electrode surface. Um, and so that doesn't change with time, but our diffusion layer does change with time. And so we can view this and so just type the math in here. So essentially just taking that equation and we can plot it out. Right? And so what we're looking at here are the effect of these two different steps, right? And so we see this growth of the diffusion layer when we apply E is much greater than our oxidant, our, our formal potential. And so we're doing hundred percent conversion versus this uh, portion where we're doing a 50% conversion. And so we see those here. And so when we go to a large over potential. We see large currents, right? We're doing a larger change. We're going from hundred percent or zero percent to hundred percent. Whereas in when we're stepping to our formal potential or our standard potential, what we have is uh, a step from zero to 50%, right? And so we see uh, that scale which is uh, what we expect to see in the equation here. Um, and so what we see in both of these is still this exponential decay, right? And so our decay is going to be proportional to the root of our diffusion coefficient divided by the root of our time, right? And so we see kind of the same structure in all of them. So being that it describes diffusion coefficient, uh, the, the diffusion layer growing uh, into the solution, the Cottrell equation really describes mass transfer limited currents. Right? And so when we have no concerns about um, kinetics, what we're going to see is this purely mass transfer controlled situation. And so um, it's important to note that it's, it's really dependent in this situation on the diffusion of species, which is a function of diffusion coefficient and time. And so this is what we will see for any given potential. And so if we just step it, if we hold the surface at a given equilibrium and allow time to progress, we will see the Cottrell equation. And so this is, this is literally just the growth of this diffusion layer with time. And so we can see this. And so if we combine each of these, we can, uh, if you're familiar with sampled current voltammetry, essentially what we're going to do is a series of chronoamperometric experiments where you step to a voltage and you let the current decay. You let the system relax. You step to a different voltage, you let the current decay. And so when we're doing that, uh, we can see what's shown down here. And so this left side shows all of those potentials and it's it's stepping from basically a cathodic over potential to an anodic over potential. Um, and we're going from the bottom all the way upwards. And so as we step to higher and higher values, what we see is this kind of rapid growth. We have almost no change. We get a rapid growth of current and then it, the difference between the potential steps really dies off. And so we have this kind of clustering at a limiting value up here for current and a clustering down at the bottom. If we want to do sampled current voltammetry, all that we're going to do is define some special time. And so here I've got it at 0 0.3 seconds. And so all that we would do is take this cut. And so we take the current at that given time, and then we can plot it as a function of potential. And so what we see is basically that uh, thermodynamic Nernst equation again, right? And so at, at a given time, because we have this fundamental relationship that is based on time and diffusion, all of these are the same in these series of experiments. And so we can take this current uh, as a function of time and voltage and recast it into our thermodynamic plot. We can vary this anywhere. We can change our sampling time, right? And so here I've decreased my, our sampling time tau to 0 0.2 seconds. And we can see that it just simply changes in magnitude, right? And so if we were to normalize all of these curves by this limiting current up here, they would all overlap with each other perfectly. Right? And so you can kind of see that those shapes are mirrored. There's tau and tau plus 0.1 seconds. And so we've got the black and the red. And we can change that as much as we want. All that we're going to do is change the magnitude of current. Okay. So what we're looking at here is the, the interaction between mass transfer and, and thermodynamics. How is this all relevant to cyclic voltammetry? Um, and so the key with cyclic voltammetry, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that we're constantly perturbing the system, right? We're going to change this. Uh, we're going to change the voltage and therefore the equilibrium continually as a function of time. And so we can turn this into a three-dimensional plot then where we have time, we have voltage, and we have current. And so what we've seen so far is Kronor amperometry. We're looking at time versus current for a given voltage. And so the two samples that I had plotted up above are broadcast onto this two-dimensional plane, right? And so if we look at on the I versus T plane, we can see that Cottrell equation very clearly. If we broadcast instead onto the thermodynamic plane here, and so now we're looking at current uh, versus E, we're looking at the relative change uh, in, in speciation at the surface, we have that sampled current voltammetry broadcast onto this back plane, right? And so we have the dark blue and the light blue uh, on that back 
if we bring this out into three dimensions, what we get is this, this mesh grid coming out. And, and so we've got, we have this kind of um, limiting step that is the uh, nurse equation embodied into our data, but it changes as a function of time, right? And so we've got this decay over time. This becomes important because in cyclical telemetry, what we're doing is following this green line. And so we're slashing across two dimensions now. And so we're working in a function of time and voltage. And so our current is going to go diagonally across here. So it has to go up. And then because time is progressing, it has to come back down, right? And so we're going to a large over potential, but the diffusion layer buildup is going to change what we see. That's also what we end up seeing here. And so we can interpret what we see in this cyclical tamogram that we saw earlier in that as we start from our cathodic over potential, our starting point with a fully reduced system, we sweep positively and we start seeing currents. This is thermodynamics embodied in the system, right? And so we're coming to a region where we're disrupting our equilibrium and forcing electron flow to cause that to happen. We hit some point where it turns around and drops down. And so the Nernst equation says that this should be a, a plateau. But because of the diffusion layer and the Cottrell equation, what we see instead is mass transfer kick in. And so we get this peak shape because we have a limiting current dictated by how quickly we can bring species from solution. This is also why when we hit our switching potential and turn around and come back in the other direction, we still see a positive current here. Right? And so here I've neglected any of the charging current in the data. Uh, but what we see is this continual charging, uh, continual positive, because we're still above that kind of 100 or 150 millivolt over potential, where we should have 100% of the oxidized species. And so what we see is this continual oxidation and growth of the diffusion layer, all the way following these red lines. Eventually, we hit this region where the Nernst equation kicks in again, and now our equilibrium is no longer 100%, and we're going to start shifting back towards 100% uh, reduced species and 0% oxidized. And then we see exactly the same thing in reverse. And so we see thermodynamics kick in. We hit a limit because now we're going to form a diffusion layer in the opposite direction, right? And so now our diffusion layer is going to be um, the reduced species 100% at the surface. When we turn around on our second sweep now and go forwards, now we understand this offset. This offset is because we're not acting on bulk solution anymore, where we had zero current, where we're at the equilibrium. We're now working on a diffusion layer that we've created at the surface of the electrode. And so as we sweep further, what we see is, again, we have negative currents all the way over here because we're reducing that residual oxidized species that still exists in bulk solution that we, we had installed into that diffusion layer. Right? And so that offset is specifically because of that diffusion layer. Um, I won't go into all the details here, but we can very easily simulate uh, these simple situations. And so if, if you've not tried simulating electron transfer processes, uh, Richard Compton over in the UK um, is probably one of the best sources to learn from. He's got a number of review articles and textbooks published on the matter. Um, and so he's, he's got a good number of, uh, he's got a good selection of uh, practice examples essentially that he walks you through so that you can learn how to do it. Uh, but all I've done here is uh, animated what we see, what we should expect to see. So the left is going to be our cyclical tamogram. The right is going to be our concentration gradients. And so we can see the growth, we can see the change and, and notice, I'll let it come back around. Notice as we approach negative 0.3 volts that we have this bulge, right? And so that bulge is what we're acting on when we're doing, um, when we have this offset over here in the negative voltage regime, right? And so we're continually perturbing the system at x is equal to zero at this surface, and it's forcing a change out into bulk solution. And so what we see is dependent on what, um, what we have previously done to the system, essentially. Uh, we can freeze some of these out, and so we can see that in action. And, and so here's the cyclic voltammogram from that video. And at the different points, the blue, the red, the black, and the orange, we have the concentration profiles um, of the reduced and the oxidized species. And so again, if we look at the formal potential, this is where we should have 50% of each. We see at the X is equal to zero, they're hitting 50%. And then we have this diffusion layer. Our reduced species from blue to red just grows outwards, right? We turn around and we come back to black. And now we've got this little bulge, this little wave of um, species that we're releasing out into solution. We come back to the orange and we see that wave still exists, right? And so on our second anodic sweep, we're acting on this wave instead of our uh, bulk um, bulk concentration in our solution, which is why we see this decrease, right? And so if we circle back and think about this, right? And so we had seen the peak currents and, and let's focus specifically on this IPA over IPC. This tells us why our IPA over IPC can't use these hard numbers, right? And so we can't say 1.0 divided by negative 0.8 uh, because that's not really the height of our peak. For the height of our peak, what we have to do is consider what our baseline is. 
right? And so um, there's two ways to do this because in this situation it's based on the Cottrell equation going here, we can extrapolate using the Cottrell equation, right? And so we can take the one over the root of uh, time and fit that curve. And so if you have a steep, a continually curving baseline, that's, that would be the appropriate way to do it. If you are more in a situation like this, where you've scanned to a large over potential, and this is almost a flat line, you can just approximate it with a linear slope. And so we see that here. And so when we wanna define our values, we wanna think about how we're processing that data. And so this is the second sweep, which would be our steady state uh, in that example I showed above. And so we have a diffusion layer build up here and we're creating a diffusion layer out here. We wanna extrapolate what's leading into it, right? And so we have this baseline that's gonna tell us the concentration that we're working with, right? And so our proper IPC value would be that peak minus that value, right? And so if we take that IPA and that IPC, we'll see that they're going to equal 1.0. What you can expect to see is going to depend on how you probe the system, right? Scan rate's one, but the initial and the switching potentials, right? And so you can kind of see that here in how steeply changing these uh, diffusion layer currents are, right? And so we can look here at variations. And so all that we're doing, you know, it's maybe a big complex plot. What a, let me zoom out a little bit so we can see it all at once. So what we're looking at is just a change in, in the initial and the switching potential uh, systematically, right? And so as we go from left to right, we're gonna change the switching potential, right? And so our anodic turnaround voltage keeps extending out further and further and further. And as we go downwards, we're gonna do it on the initial voltage. And so we're gonna start from more of a negative value as we, as we go. Um, and so what we can see is in these extremes, when we let the, cur the system go for so long that we're, we're basically beginning to approximate bulk solution, uh, a change in bulk solution, we see quite stable behavior. Right. If we, as we go closer um, and have very close to the edge here, our diffusion currents are dropping dramatically. And so what we see over time is that there's a lot of variation in those peak intensities, right? And so the, the lesson here, so what you really want to do is try to push it as far away from the peak as you can without causing unwanted chemistry to happen, right? And so if we do that, if we go down into this middle region, for example, what we see is nice stable behavior. Um, the key is, again, that we don't want to see anything irreversible starting to happen there. But that'll give us nice predictable behavior. You want to be careful if you're studying a new system, you have to think about what is actually in there. And so if we do a bad start, for example, if we choose our initial voltage uh, to be something that's far away from our equilibrium point in our, in our solution or on our surface, uh, what we would expect to see. And so here we're starting, we're in a fully reduced system. We're starting at the formal potential. We see this huge oxidizing current flow. And as we go forwards, it gets worse and worse, right? And so here we see a little bit of thermodynamics kicking in here. There's a little bit of a blip. But by the time we go to 100 millivolts positive, all that we see is diffusion limited currents right off the offset. And so we see no peaks. We see no, nothing happen here because of that, right? And so you want to familiarize yourself a little bit with what's going on in your system to select an effective place to start. Um, this is easily done with open circuit potential. And so your, your electrochemical workstation is going to have some means of measuring uh, your open circuit potential. This is just your bulk equilibrium, right? It, it's the equilibrium at the surface where there's no current flow. And so if you set your EI to start at least to that EOC, uh, you'll have a good starting point. You don't necessarily have to do that. If you have good reason to, you can start from any voltage that you want, but it's a good idea to start looking at that value. And so for example, here, what we're looking at is we're starting at a large oxidizing over potential, which is far from equilibrium. And so we get this oxidizing current that flows and we're sweeping negatively. But after that first sweep, we've reached an equilibrium state here. And if you think back to that video we saw, that's because we're working on a diffusion gradient that we formed near the surface, right? And so we can still see the characteristic behavior of the system if we're lucky, right? But it comes down to understanding exactly what's happening in your system and no two systems are going to behave identically right and so uh, when you start before you become familiar with your system definitely set your initial voltage to that open circuit potential and then you can play around afterwards and, and probe the system and maybe learn something new afterwards those of course are the ideal situations and so we can move away uh, and start looking at more complex situations and so currents are additive if we have multiple things happening in a solution um, they're just going to add together. And so here's an example of three distinct redox processes in the solution where none of them are interacting with each other. And so we can see the CV for process one, two, and three, we're oxidizing them. And we can see that the diffusion currents for them are exactly the same. They're just delayed by some time. 
All of them are going to have this little wave that extends out into solution. And we're going to act on that wave and see slightly different behavior on the second sweep and the first sweep. And so again, this is a situation where they don't interact with each other. And so we can freeze these out, same as what we did. Um, I'll go through these fairly quickly and, and send out images of these later on. Um, but what we're looking at, and so this is the concentration profile for this first redox couple where the dashed line is. And so we can see for the blue, the black, the orange, the purple, and the green, all that we're doing is extending that diffusion layer out into solution. When we get back to the orange, we've reversed it. And now we're starting to get, or sorry, the red, uh, we're starting to get this bulge in solution. And I've got my labels reversed again, sorry. No, I don't, they're right. Um, and then the second one, we see exactly the same thing, except our potentials and our times are different. And so um, the blue and, and the green here are going to have that wave that's formed in solution of concentration. And of course, this third potential, we're going to see the same thing. And so they're all showing the same behavior. They're all adding together. Uh, the only difference is um, mass transfer versus time. And so if we want to analyze this, if we're in this situation where we've got this happening in the lab, what we want to do is think about what our baseline should be, right? And so here they're relatively well spaced. You might be in a situation where they're only spaced out by several tens or maybe 100 millivolts here. When they get very close to each other, it's very hard to pick out a distinct peak uh, in, in current and potentially even uh, potential. And so what you want to do is think about these fundamentals. If you're working on a solution and things are going to be mass transfer limited, um, you can fit the backside of this curve with the Cottrell equation, right? You go up the second one, same thing. You have the Cottrell equation coming down from this current. And so we can fit each of those and we can very clearly pick out the IPA value for our redux processes one, two, and three. Right? And so the key here is that as we keep building towards more and more complex systems, it's still these fundamentals that are always going to be in play, right? And so it's thermodynamics, kinetics, and mass transfer. And, and I haven't talked too much about kinetics here. Uh, I think it's a whole nother ball game. So, so we'll focus on, on these two for now. And so thermodynamics and mass transfer. Of course, in the research setting, we're, we're interested in much more complex situations. And so these uh, idealized are uh, examples are for fully reversible solvated redox couples using our kind of routine semi-infinite diffusion uh, approximation. What we're often looking at, and so, you know, taking the context of most of the stuff that happens electrochemically here at Waterloo, we really have kind of three themes. One of them is batteries, and so we're looking at thin electroactive films on an electrode surface where we have uh, the redox species is not out in the bulk solution, but it's immobilized in some finite thickness at the electrode surface. Um, we have sensors, and so we're looking usually at some chemical interaction between an electrode material and something in the solution or something in the ambient environment. Um, and then we have irreversible reactions and electrocatalysis. And so these could be heterogeneous or homogeneous. And so each one of these, we're, we're doing the same fundamental thing. We're considering mass transfer, we're considering thermodynamics, and we're considering kinetics, except we're doing it, uh, we have to change our approximations uh, and adjust the math of what we do. And so uh, we'll look at thin films first, things that would be relevant to battery materials. And the key change here is the time scale of the experiment. Um, and so we're working uh, now in, in a restricted amount of material, but also one of the most important things is that it's going to have um, a, a change in diffusion, basically. And so what we can look at uh, is if we were to have an immobilized monolayer, right? if, if all that we're looking at is thermodynamics, uh, what we expect to see, and you can find this in Bart, Alan Bard's textbook, um, is peaks that are directly on top of each other. And so we're seeing the Nernst equation, and here what we're doing is we pass that kind of um, the inflection point in the in the Nernst equation, and we're coming back down because we've changed all of the material on the surface. There, there is we cannot replenish it from bulk solution, um, and so we have to change away from that semi-infinite diffusion and, and move over towards a finite diffusion model. When we adjust the math to do that, we change the characteristics that we expect to see. And so for a reversible couple like this, instead of our peak value, uh, we have this new equation. Notice that the D value is completely gone. There's no diffusion factoring in. Our EPA and EPC are now stacked on top of each other, which would be our E1 half in the other situation, right? And so this shift would approximate our formal potential. Um, and then we have the peak width. And so um, what we're looking at here is essentially the full width at half mass. And so again, it's going to be a function of the number of electrons transferred. One of the most important things to consider here um, is that the switch between infinite and finite diffusion conditions is really a function of time, right? It is technically possible uh, for any given system to, 
to operate in either of those situations. It depends on the time frame on which uh, mass can move around in your system um, and the rate at which you're probing the system, right? Um, and so we'll, we'll see a little bit of that here. And so in, in terms of mass transfer, uh, I grabbed an example from Jeff Don's group here for lithium nickel oxide because he's got some beautiful structural and electrochemical data uh, inside of it. And so what he's doing here, um, so, so in a, it's not very common in battery research that you'll see cyclic voltammetry. Uh, instead, you charge by constant current, but you can take that current and convert it into this derivative plot. And so you can chain, do the change uh, the derivative of um, charge as over the derivative of voltage. And, and this gives you essentially the same thing as what a cyclic voltammogram is. Um, and so we, we see the same type of uh, information coming out of this. And, and so what uh, Don's group was doing was lithium nickel oxide. And so looking at the redox chemistry of lithium nickel oxide as, as a battery material. Um, and so although it, the redox process is nominally just the oxidation of nickel ions, uh, there are changes in structure, right? And so there, there's chemistry that goes on after the fact. And so as you take electrons out, you change the average oxidation state, you're changing the bonding inside of the material, you're changing the dimensions of the unit cell, and you're changing the lithium content inside the material. This causes a structure change. And so what you can see here is although this is all the same nominal oxidation of nickel, there's actually a series of peaks. And so the, the paper itself has uh, in situ X-ray diffraction results in it showing these different phases that form. And so this is H1, M, uh, H2, and uh, H3 that form, right? So these four different phases across this voltage region um, that you can see differences in, in current as a function of, of time there. Now, the reason that people typically don't do, or one of the reasons that people typically don't do cyclic voltammetry is the time frames here. And so we're dealing with the solid state, diffusion is very slow. And so these experiments were done at C20, uh, C over 20, C over 100, um, which for those who don't do battery research is 20 or 100 hour long charging, discharging cycles, right? And so that's a very long experiment. If we were to do cyclic voltammetry, if we consider this 1.2 volt window, um, over this time frame, we're looking at approximately 20 microvolts per second as our sweep rate, right? This ends up looking very similar to that CV. If we were to do this at 100 millivolts per second, we'd see essentially nothing. You'd see a little bit of oxidation at the surface, but you wouldn't be able to oxidize into the bulk of it the way that, that this experiment is doing. Uh, and so you'd see completely different uh, current versus potential behavior, right? The key to that is in the Cottrell equation, right? And so there's this uh, D up on, on the top here. It's the growth in that diffusion layer. And so if we shock the system really quickly and D is very small, we really can't see anything that's changing. And so the, the key here is that it's a function of how, uh, how you're probing the system. And so if your diffusion coefficient is going to decrease by orders of magnitude, so too uh, does your scan rate have to in order to see the same results. Going to secondary reactions, and so this would be uh, suitable for sensors or uh, we'll see getting into electrocatalysis as well. Um, and so what we're looking at uh, is now not just a simple electron transfer reaction, but an electron transfer reaction followed by some sort of a chemical step. And so here, for example, maybe we reduce an oxidized species and that reduced species can bind to our surface. And so we'll have this star as our surface. We want to break this into discrete elementary steps. And so we have our reduction reaction and we have our chemical reaction. We can uh, describe this with thermodynamics and kinetics as well. And so we'll be interested here in just this, the equilibrium. And so we'll say uh, we have some adsorption uh, equilibrium. That's going to be just the, the activity of the uh, product over the activity of the reactants. We can factor that into our NERST equation because K adsorbed are, is a constant, we can factor that out. And so using applying some um, logarithmic identities, we can take that out. And now we can group together all of our constants. And so this red highlighted species tells us that our formal potential is going to be modified by some constant, right? And so as we change that constant, what we see is, is a change in thermodynamics for the overall process, right? And so what we have here is basically the embodiment of Le Chatelier principle, uh, affecting our electrochemical behavior, right? And so if we have the product of our species um, is adsorbing to the surface, the stronger it adsorbs, the lower the overpotential you're going to see it appear at. And so if this is our diffusion limited peak, D is a weak adsorption, A is a very strong adsorption, right? And so this is a really favorable process. You're going to see it. It's self-limiting because we have a limited surface area. And so you come back down to zero. And then if you see this diffusion peak going, that means there's not blocking, that you can still oxidize out into solution or reduce out into solution, right? And so by the location of this peak, we have a measure of what the adsorption strength of that species is, right? So we can directly probe that chemical equilibrium. 
it can go the other way. And so what we can, what we might see is instead we have our reactant absorbed to the surface and that's the species that reacts, right? And so we have an internal uh, coordination sphere mechanism going on now that if always just floating in solution, it might not get reduced. But if it, as soon as it binds to your surface, then it can be reduced, then we can draw it like this, right? Um, and so what we see now is the secondary process um, and we get it on the other side. And so we have our diffusion limited peak and then because our precursor, this is our precursor that's absorbed to the surface, right? It's happy being bound to the surface. And so it takes basically extra energy to convince it to leave the surface. Again, this is Le Chatelier um, embodied in the work. These are all based on equilibria. We can look at changes in equilibria uh, with the common example of proton coupled electron transfers. Um, and so the key difference here is that in the PCET process, we can change the thermodynamic equilibrium that is this K-adsorbed species, right? And so here we're not going to tune that K-adsorbed, but here we have the PKA of the species. And as we move away from the PKA, we're going to change the equilibrium for protonation, deprotonation of our species. And so now we have a way of systematically changing what's going to happen in the system. We can take a shortcut. And so instead we'll just write our reaction quotient as the overall product. And so we're gonna have our, our protonated reduced species. And then uh, the multiplication of our O and, and H to the, uh, power of m at the bottom. We can control h separately from the electron transfer by changing the solution pH, and so we can remove that out. And so now we've got this red highlighted piece that tells us that as we change the concentration of protons, we're going to change where we expect to see the peak, right? This is purely a thermodynamic phenomenon. And so we can see that here in, in poor Bay diagrams. And so what we see is as we change our pH, we alter the equilibrium for this protonation, deprotonation elementary step, which changes the overall thermodynamics for the complete process. And so we see that as these slopes um, that tell us something about mechanisms, right? Um, and so we know that we're going, as we go vertical, we're changing uh, our stable redox state. As we go horizontal, we're changing our stable protonation state. And so when we cross these lines that are diagonal, we're doing both an electron and a proton transfer. The nice thing about this is we can pick out a lot of neat mechanistic information, right? And so we can pick out equilibrium constants, in this case, a pKa, but we can generalize this, right? And so we can go to ligands if we, if we view the proton as a ligand here. Um, there's been lots of stuff done uh, where you can look at um, dissociation of ligands, right? And so if you change the oxidation state of a metal center, a cobalt center, for example, you can change it from wanting to bind a ligand to not binding a ligand, right? And so we can learn about the formation constant for such reactions, right? And so this can become very useful in studying sensors and looking at reaction chemistry and understanding reaction mechanisms. Of course, we can expand this outwards. Um, and so th those are examples of an ECR mechanism. And so this, the nomenclature, um, a lot of this was, was developed um, kind of as electrochemistry developed decades ago. Um, and, and the terminology, a lot of the way that we're talking about this these, these days was thanks to Jean-Michel Saviant, uh, the late great uh, electrochemist who unfortunately passed away last year. Um, but what we're looking at uh, is, is this new terminology where we're gonna say E is an electron transfer, C is a chemical reaction. And so PCET is what we would call an ECR. And so we have a reversible chemical reaction with an electron transfer. We can build this up in complexity. I'll show a couple of common cases here. And so our, our chemical step might be irreversible, right? It, as uh, that we just completely remove the species from solution. Um, and so we're moving this away into a second species, key being this one-way arrow. We can have a catalytic mechanism where our redox active species once generated reacts with something else in solution to regenerate our starting material. Um, or we can have a chain of electron transfers that might happen. For example, in ECE, we, we oxidize it. It does some chemistry. Maybe it changes structure uh, as in the lithium nickel oxide case. And then another electron transfer happens, right? All of these contribute some parameters to the behavior that we see. And so it would change the way that we mathematically approach this. Experimentally, we really only have control over what we're probing, scan rate, initial, and switching voltages. If we want to play around with the chemistry, we can maybe tune the species that it's reacting with to, to alter these parameters a little bit. But most of the time, these are parameters that are dictated by the reaction we're looking at, and we don't want to change that reaction too much. So we can look at some examples of what we expect to see, and I'll try to go through this fairly quickly because I think we're running out of time. Um, but some examples, um, and again, these come from Alan Bard's textbook, of, of an ECI mechanism. And so if we look at what we expect for uh, a cyclovoltaic uh, curve for an ECI mechanism, it, it, it's all a function of the rate of the chemical reaction versus the rate at which you probe the system, right? And so if we scan at really high rates, a chemical reaction essentially has no chance to do any chemistry. It doesn't progress any. And so we see reversible behavior. 
as we decrease the scan rate, what we see is moving more and more towards a completely irreversible system, right? And so we generate the species and then it decomposes, let's say, right? When we do that, we have absolutely no reverse process happening, right? If we scan fast enough, we can still see the original behavior, right? We can see that perfect irreversible behavior that we expect. And so that, that's where we start coming into these uh, quasi-reversible and irreversible terminology. We have this characteristic behavior in our limiting situations. And in this quasi-reversible region in the middle, we've got kind of a blend of the two, right? It works out beautifully that all of this behavior can be generalized based on mechanism. And so as long as we can generalize based on this, that we know that we have an electron transfer followed by a chemical reaction, uh, we can convert the whole system into dimensionless parameters, and we can use that to view any individual reaction that is following that mechanism. In order to do that, we have to combine kinetics and thermodynamics, right? And so we need to consider the relative kinetics of the electron transfer and everything else that's happening in the system, and the relative thermodynamics of the electron transfer combined with everything else in the system as well, right? And so we we're looking at time, oops, time versus equilibrium, basically. And so for electrochemistry, we're going to define this tau parameter. It changes based on technique. For uh, cyclic voltammetry, it's based on your scan rate. And so RT over F times your scan rate. Um, we can uh, develop this dimensionless kinetics term. We're going to call it lambda. And it's a function of the two. And so this is going to have units of seconds. Our chemical rate constants have units of inverse seconds. And so if we multiply the two together, we get a, a unitless or a dimensionless parameter. And so this tells us something about how the system is interacting with each other, right? how these reactions are, are uh, affecting each other. As we change the nature of the reactions, we have to change how we define this a little bit, right? And so for a reversible system, we would consider forwards and backwards. For irreversible, we only need forwards. If we're doing catalysis, the concentration of the species with which the species that redox generated species is reacting becomes important, right? And so we tune that a little bit based on what we're doing. Where it's generalized, we can start gen uh, looking at behavior like this. And so this, this is a working curve. I couldn't find a good zone diagram for this, but um, as an example, what we're looking at, this would be our lambda parameter for chrono Um, And so as we go left and right, what we're changing is where we are in balancing uh, reaction kinetics versus electron transfer kinetics. Um, and so we're basically, we're going uh, to higher scan rates to the left and lower scan rates to the right, or the opposite for our kinetic rate constant. And then we can have some behavior parameter that helps us define. And what we have is our reversible situation, pure diffusion on the left, right? And so when we scan really fast, we see that we have a purely diffusion based. When we scan really slow, we have completely irreversible. And so that's over on this far right side. And we have this transition zone in the middle, which is our quasi reversible center, right? So it has some contribution from mass transfer, some contribution from kinetics. We can start looking at this and applying this. And so the key here is that this is a map because it's dimensionless, we can use this as a map. And so we have a kinetic parameter and a thermodynamic parameter. We can plot that kinetic parameter versus a thermodynamic parameter for our electron transfer reaction in cyclic voltammetry. And so we saw above, what we expect is the shape of the wave. And so EP minus E one half, how wide is that wave? We can plot that as our thermodynamic value. And so this working curve shows us the same thing that we have, again, with these same values at approximately negative one, uh, 10 to the minus one here. Uh, we're looking at purely diffusion based. And when we get a, approach 1.0 or 10, we're looking at pure kinetic. And so we see that here, right? And so we have our limiting behavior here for a reversible system, which we expect uh, up above. And then as we uh, change our scan rate, uh, decrease our scan rate, we'd start seeing a change, right? And so the shape of our peak would change. These can become very useful because this is dimensionless, it's telling us general behavior. And so experimentally, we often don't know anything about that chemical reaction. That's what we want to find, right? We want to learn about the kinetics of that chemical reaction, for example. And so we can use these plots to derive that information, to measure that information. And so what we would do is acquire our scan rate dependent data, right? A whole bunch of cyclical tamograms at different scan rates. We would then analyze each of those to extract whichever parameters we find interesting, right? Maybe the peak, maybe the, the charge under a curve, maybe the shape of the peak. Um, and then what we can do is plot those parameters as our um, y-axis, and we can adjust, right? So lambda, if we go back and look at it, we're controlling our scan rate. If we're looking at, let's say, the irreversible, we're controlling our scan rate. What we have to do is vary kf, right? We vary kf until our curves overlap with these working curves with these theoretical data, and that gives us a measure of what our kf value likely is in our solution, right? And so it gives us a direct way of, of pulling out rate constants. And so combining these two together, uh, what we can do is diagnose reaction mechanisms, right? And so we have a different, we'll see in a minute, a different zone diagram, different set of behavior that we expect for different reaction mechanisms. And so matching what we see in a scan rate dependent situation 
with what we theoretically expect can tell us the order of operations, if you will. These working curves can then be used to pick out specific numbers, um, thermodynamic values or kinetic values for those uh, interfering chemical reactions. And so um, key to this is that uh, we, can, we can take this dimensionless perspective with any reaction mechanism. We just have to work out the math of it and simulate what you would expect to see uh, and, and do it. And so with it takes time and experience. There's a lot of options. But again, the key is that as long as something is following a given reaction mechanism, it's going to show the same behavior. It's not going to show the same behavior at the same scan rate. It's a function of this lambda parameter, right? And so it's your scan rate relative to the kinetics of that process um, or the thermodynamics of the process. And so we'll see some examples of those here. Um, the key is with, with time, um, familiarize yourself with these things, right? And so look at the different reaction types, look at the expected behavior and consider it. You might have to extend your scan rates far beyond uh, what you're comfortable normally doing, right? A lot of people will do scan cycle voltammetry between 10 and hundred millivolts per second and call it a day. You might have to go faster. You might have to go slower, right? And so I've, I've done them before at hundred microvolts per second to see behavior clearly. Um, and it really gives you that extra bit of information that you need to diagnose a mechanism. So here's another example, so cyclic voltammetry. And so for our, our kinetic situation, uh, taking a working curve and we're looking at the, the shape of our peak um, versus our dimensionless kinetic parameter. So we have pure diffusion, we have pure kinetic, um, and we have this intermediate transition zone. Um, and what we look at for the irreversible here, uh, when we're doing kinetic, the key is there's no peak, right? And so we get this um, limiting behavior where we exponentially go upwards and we hit, hit a plateau. And so this plateau will be, um, either a kinetic limit or a mass transfer limit, depending on the system you're working on. We can flip it. We might have a chemical reaction first, followed by an electrochemical reaction. And so here's our first example of a complete zone diagram. Right? And so in our complete zone diagram, what we have to consider, we have here a single chemical reaction. And so we can use our parameter, our thermodynamic parameter as the equilibrium constant for that. Our kinetic parameter would be as we defined it above. And so now we see that it's not a simple matter, right? And so we have it, what we see is going to depend on log of K. And so depending on the chemistry of your system, maybe you're way up here, it's really favorable. And as you change your scan rate, all you're ever gonna see is a purely diffusion limited case. If you have a means of tuning your K, right? And so a proton coupled electron transfer, for example, you can move this up and down by changing your pH, right? As you change your pH, you can change your scan rate you expect to slice this in different regions, right? And so remember you're working in multi-dimensional space here. Um, and so you can go through and each one of these regions has a very distinct type of behavior that you expect to see. Um, and so here's an example um, where it's scanning at log of K of minus three. And so it's scanning across here. And so we're cutting through each of these different zones. Um, and so you can see at, at point one, it's over here in the diffusion limited zone. And so you get a nice strong oxidation peak, or sorry, I think he's reversed. Um, you get a nice strong reduction peak and then a nice strong oxidation peak that's paired to it. Purely reversible behavior. Um, as you decrease your scan rate, the chemical reaction starts to factor in more. We're moving right across the zone diagram. You start to distort the behavior, right? We could generate working diagrams on that. And I see Jillian coming on. I'm gonna very quickly go through, just show people some examples and Perfect, I'll wrap you. it up. And so <laughs> we, we have a zone diagram here uh, for a quasi-reversible, so electron transfer kinetics factoring in followed by an irreversible chemical reaction. And again, the complexity is going up. We're introducing more parameters that are important. We're introducing the number of things that we have to consider. An ECE, electron transfer, chemical reaction, electron transfer. There's a possibility here, if the second transfer is easier to do uh, thermodynamically than the first transfer, that we have a disproportionation reaction that we have to factor in. And so this is going to factor into all of this as well, right? Um, and so we can generate, again, these, these characteristic behaviors that we expect to see based on the thermodynamics of the chemical reaction and our dimensionless parameter. If we get into the situation where that disproportionation reaction factors in, now we have a very complex series of possibilities, all fundamentally different reaction mechanisms. And if we show it in its full complexity, uh, we can see that we have pure situations, our limiting situations. And in between all of them, we have this kind of blended behavior, right? Where we see contributions from both. And so there we're gonna wrap it up. Um, voltammetry, key to it is voltammetry is super easy to set up, super easy to do. Um, there's of course a lot of practical aspects, polishing your electrode effectively, clean electrode uh, solutions and everything. Um, but my message to people would be, um, it's really all based on fundamentals. And so uh, really deeply learn the fundamentals, mass transfer, kinetics, thermodynamics, um, and then look at 
some of the complexity that's out there in the literature. There, there's a lot of situations where this has been worked out. Um, it's very powerful. And so instead of just, um, you know, I've got the statement here somewhere, you know, you want to push yourself beyond just saying it's a reversible system. It's an irreversible system. It's a quasi reversible system. Don't just look for the duct shape. Look at what you can do to the duct shape, right? It's going to teach you something about the chemistry in your system. And with that, I'm done. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. That was awesome. That was really, really great in-depth uh, overview of everything about cyclic voltammetry. Thank you. I think everyone definitely learned a lot. For everyone who uh, maybe joined a little late, um, if you want to post any of your questions in the chat box, uh, I can read them out and we can go through um, any questions that anybody has. So I think we did have one earlier in the talk which I think was at the sort of towards the beginning, which was about the reasoning for the values of, of 28 or 28.5 millivolts for the CV for a, an ideal reversible system. And they're asking the reasoning for that value. And if that's always going to be the case for an ideal reversible system or like where that, that comes from. Yeah, so, so it's supposed to be. And so this is what people often, when, when they're doing electrochemistry, they're actually often looking for this. And so this, these are the values that come out in an ideal situation. Right. And so if, um, if, if you do this approach, right, so it's the ideal situation, uh, as we saw here, uh, there's my curve that I'm looking for. Um, the ideal situation for a reversible couple is thermodynamics, you have an onset, and then you hit a mass transfer limit and it decays. This is very characteristic behavior. And, and so really, it's, it's the blending of um, thermodynamics and mass transfer together. And so that, um, you know, the, the the detailed math of that's all worked out in Alan Bard's textbook and basically any electrochemistry textbook, uh, but it comes out of that relationship. Perfect. Um, someone else is asking if you teach an electrochemical course that they can join. <laughs> uh, I do. Um, I will be in January. It, it varies year to year. And so I teach it as a 400, at a fourth year um, elective in chemistry. Uh, I open it up to usually MS students. And if there's space, I open it up to whoever wants to join. Um, and yeah, so it, it's offered, it's offered this January and I think it's offered, it looks like it's going to be offered next January as well. Perfect. Is that open to graduate students too? Cause I think a few people are, are interested. I, I have not made a graduate course on this yet. My graduate course is on structure analysis and spectroscopy instead. Um, okay. I do intend to, um, but with awesome. teaching, teaching loads the way they are, I'm, I'm usually, most of my teaching load goes to undergrad at the moment. And so of course. Um, I, I will eventually develop one for grad students. I often have grad students sit in on the undergrad course. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's a good option for people if they're interested. Awesome. Um, while we're waiting for any others, I have a couple quick questions. Um, so we talked about mostly like 2D electrode surfaces. And I know once you go to, for example, like battery electrodes, we talked about how there's like solid state diffusion you have to consider. If you have like sort of a, a non-ideal 3D electrode surface, how does that also influence things or like porous electrodes? Does that just make your diffusion much more complicated? Um, it's complicated. For example, yeah, it's just, it's just uh, complicated, yeah, I guess. Yeah, no, no. So, so a lot of it depends on the nature of the film, right? And okay. so uh, if, if you're in the situation where your entire film is electroactive and all you have to worry about is kind of uniform diffusion passing through the film, um, it will act like a thin layer of cell um, where the time frame on which you need to probe it is dictated by the diffusion coefficient of the ions in that solid. If you have pores in the solution, that of course changes it. And so when, when you develop the models for this, uh, you have to define the diffusion, right? And, and so of course, all of electron transfer can't happen without ion transfer. And so the ions have to come in to the, to the material. By introducing pores, you facilitate transfer of ions into specific channels that then have to branch out into your material. And so you have to develop a model for diffusion that factors that in, right? Okay. And so it does become more complex. The, these examples are all for kind of parallel diffusion. Um, if, if, you're, if you have a fully conductive surface that's just very rough, um, it will, uh, it depends on the current flow, right? And so basically, if you look at an ultra micro electrode, you, you never really run into mass trans, excuse me, mass transfer issues. Um, but what you do run into, uh, but, but if you uh, make an array of ultra micro electrodes on a surface, uh, what you start seeing is diffusion layer coming back in. Right? And so it depends on, you know, we, we've got a drawn here for these diffusion layers that we're going out into two-dimensional space. Uh, 
Um, in Bard's textbook, he's got a nice little example of what happens with time. And so this is, you know, if, if you have a, a roughened surface that you have little nodules poking out all over the place, the diffusion layer is going to grow out uniform to that. And so it's got that texture to it. But as it goes outwards, it's going to start interacting with each other. And, you know, the, they're going out spherically, basically. And, right. and they'll, they'll eventually hit the point that you've got a flat front that's going outwards. And so, you know, that then introduces exactly the same situation as this. Okay. Okay. So, so it depends, cool. again, time frames and scales of what you're working with. Okay. Awesome. Um, someone else would like to know if your course is open to outsiders, like uh, not at our university. I would assume it's it's probably in person or yeah, not at the moment. Yeah, not at the um, moment. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Um, I've not dove into the realm of open courses just yet. Um, pre ten years, I've got my hands full. <laughs> That's fair. It seems like you would have some support if you do though in the future. Um, well, yeah. So I guess we'll see uh, if if anyone else has any other questions. Feel free to. Uh, well, someone's asking if so rough surfaces will lead to peak broadening? Um, not necessarily. Uh, again, it, it depends on, uh, you will definitely distort away from the expected behavior, um, but it depends on how the diffusion layer is growing. Um, and so versus your scan rate as well, right? And so, you know, that, that diffusion layer is going to grow at some rate. Basically, once it extends uh, far enough away from the surface, it becomes uniform, right? And so, uh, over time, it will move towards that limiting behavior. And so what you expect, so an ultra microelectrode looks, the behavior looks something like this. Um, and so as you, uh, if you scan it at a, at a rate such that diffusion does start factoring in, it'll move towards example two here, right? And so you, you basically, um, you know, this would be no diffusion problems. This would be diffusion starting to factor in. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um... I'll ask another one while I wait to see if there's any other questions, but um, we, we talked a little bit about how, so for example, there's a difference between the second scan on the CV versus the first one. Um, would you say that it's typically like sort of steady state by the time you've done the second scan, or is that something you kind of have to test for every system to make sure you're getting like a repeatable uh, result for like the third and fourth scan? You, you, you do have to test. Um, sorry, I'm just looking for, um, <laughs> I think I had one of these. Right. Um, yeah. Again, it, it depends. It's a function of your starting point, your switching potential, and your scan rate. Um, and and so what it is is you're you're working on BEs, right? And so if you're giving it enough time, that either you have such a big diffusion layer that you're you're kind of approximating working on bulk solution, a different bulk solution than what bulk solution is, um, or such a, a long time frame uh, in, in the opposite direction that you do reset it back to bulk solution, um, then it's there. But um, yeah, it, it's really a dependent on the time at which you probe. And this okay. is where I recommend that everybody, you know, instead of sitting down and doing one experiment and being done, um, vary scan rates, right? Um, yeah. You can vary them by orders of magnitude fairly quickly. Um, of course, it's like impedance, right? In impedance, you go to low frequencies, it really adds time onto your experiment. But sometimes those data points give you the information you need, right? So. Perfect. Um, and then I think someone's asking if this uh, Jupyter notebook or, or the notes on this are going to be available possibly to attendees after. Um, so I'll, I'll convert it into a PDF and share it around. Uh, a lot of them perfect. depend on these files, for example, um, that have, uh, maybe I can share the files too. Uh, I'll have a look. I, I, I know I can Either export way. it as, as a website that has, I, I tried doing it earlier, but it, there was something wrong with the formatting somewhere in here that it just you know, it was fine for half of it. And then the rest of it was just a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but I'll, I'll try to put it in a format that can be shared out. Perfect. That, yeah, that would be great. I think uh, I'll, I'll pass it to Jillian awesome. and she can pass it to whoever wants it. Yes, I can definitely do that. Um, and then I think a few more questions. Is it possible or common to do CV on flow systems like flow batteries or electrodialysis slash ion exchange membrane processes? Yep. Um, and so in that, that situation, um, you, you're going to, you're taking mass transfer out, right? And so then you get into the situation that you'll see uh, more similar to this behavior, right? And so sampled current voltammetry. Um, the key to that is you'd have your, um, you know, you, you start this because thermodynamics is telling you that you're going to, um, and then you have this limit in this situation because of mass transfer, right? This current goes down because the diffusion layer grows. By doing a flow system or a rotating disc or an ultra micro electrode, what you're effectively doing is removing mass transfer from the situation, right? And so if you were to flow, this peak would go or this plateau would go higher in current. 
the faster you flow, the higher that plateau would go. Right? Same with the rotating disc, the faster you spin it, the higher that current will go. Perfect. And then I think maybe the, the final question for now, um, are there, could you introduce any good textbooks for electrochemistry? Any recommendations? Barton Faulkner. Barton Faulkner. That, <laughs> uh, that was what I was assuming. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know if any others exist. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in all honesty, so so that Barton Faulkner's is kind of the the one that most people will go to. It's very thorough and mathematical. Um, it describes it. What it does is it draws on literature from kind of the 1940s through the 1980s, sort of a thing, where a lot of the fundamentals were established, um, and so it has a lot of the kind of phys chem details of it on on the mathematics behind it. Um, Jean-Michel Savion had, has one as well on more of the zone diagrams and reaction mechanisms. Um, uh, Cyril Constantine took over with that, and so they just put out a new version of it two years ago, I think it was. Um, and so that one's very good for looking at mechanistic analysis. Bard's textbook touches on it a little bit. Um, but if you want, you know, fundamentals, core, you know, descriptions of techniques, Bard and Faulkner, um, for understanding voltammetry and, and that behavior. Um, Savion's textbook. Um, and if you want for voltammetry specific, uh, Compton, Richard Compton has a number of them that, that look at just the behavior or the modeling and simulation of. Perfect. I think we have one more question. Oh, um, I can try to, I think people are asking for spelling of the textbook author's names. I can try to send out, I know Barden Faulkner, I can check the spelling for the other one. <laughs> um, and then I think we have one other question about if you need very high sensitivity for biomolecules for quantification is SWV, I'm assuming they mean cyclic voltammetry at CV, uh, typically the most sensitive method for, I guess, for biomolecule quantification, quantitation. Um, hmm. it, it varies. Uh, so, so you can, with modern equipment, you can measure down to nanoamps if you're in a controlled environment, um, e even lower sometimes. And so you can measure um, very small concentrations. Um, and, and so electrochemistry is exquisitely sensitive. It, it's really amazing how sensitive it is, um, but it comes down to control, right? And so the, the perks of using something like square wave voltammetry, uh, in cyclic voltammetry, you, you change something once, right? And, and so, you, you know, you do a sweep, you oxidize, if it's bound to your surface, for example, you oxidize it and you're done, right? And so you, you, you count it once. Um, if you do square wave, you get to do both. Right, and so you you oxidize it and then you reduce it, and so each one molecule or each species that you're looking at, you're counting twice, um, and so you can increase sensitivity a little bit in that sense. It also helps to remove a little bit of charging current and background issues like that as well uh, that can make things more prominent. Um, but but yeah, it's um, you, know, you, you can do it with voltammetry if you're if you're careful and and explore right. So play with scan rates and, and look at what's possible. Perfect. Um, I think that that is all of our questions. So thank you so much to Dr. Smith for, uh, for this incredible talk. I will uh, yeah, find a way to send either a PDF or some version of this to the attendees today. Um, thank you for everyone who has attended today. For anyone who's interested, there are going to be further workshops in this series. We have one coming up in about just under two weeks um, on electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, EIS. Um, and that's hosted by Dr. Aslan Kosakian from the University of Alberta. So that's going to be on November 24th, and we're going to start advertising for that soon. So stay tuned for that. I think we had a few issues with the Eventbrite site today. And I know a few people had issues logging on at the beginning. So we're gonna make sure we have all of those technical issues sorted. And I apologize to anyone who had any issues with that. Um, so we're, we're gonna sort all of that out before uh, advertising for the next one, but please stay tuned for the next event in this series if you're interested. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Smith, and thank you for all of you uh, for coming today and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye everyone. <laughs>